I've got to tell you, this is, uh, I've done several of these, these kinds of virtual presentations, and it's, it's really, really weird. As most of you, some of you at least, uh, have had the uh, dubious distinction of seeing me in person. I know this is maybe the sixth or seventh year, or, or maybe more, in a row that I've done this speaker series. And generally, we're there in the ABOR offices, and, and it's a really pleasant uh, environment. We'll all be able to see each other and talk and, and communicate. And But here, I'm simply talking to my computer. And, and it's really weird because that's I'm, in, I'm sitting in my home office here uh, just talking to my computer and pretending that I can see people out in front of me and, and have some idea of reception and so forth. Well, anyway... As you can see, what we're showing here, uh, the, the economic and, and real estate outlook in today's market, just basically all the bets are off. And, and uh, uh, you're gonna hear me say a couple of times, uh, worst on record and don't have a clue. And quite frankly, right now, let me, let me just forewarn you about everything we're gonna talk about. There isn't an, an economist in the world right now, not one that really knows what's going on in terms of being able to give a, 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 a highly reliable uh, forecast. And, and, there, and I, 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 you can imagine that we're reading everybody we can find and seeing what they have to say about it and what they're projecting and what they're talking about and so on. And I got to tell you, it ranges across the board from so to slightly bad to Armageddon. Uh, and we, you throw out the extremes, there is sort of a general consensus, but it's, we don't have a clue. <laughs> if you want to know the honest answer, we've never been here before. We've never had a mandated, government mandated, di di directed shutdown of everything. Just go home, everybody shut your doors that we had back in April and May, uh, starting in middle March and so forth. We're officially in a recession. If, uh, if uh, I don't want to bust your bubble on this, and it's not a big deal, really. But the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, and that's the organization of economists that officially uh, designate when uh, cycles start and when they peak and when they trough and how long they last and so forth. Uh, and, and they have determined that they announced uh, that February was the peak in the current economic uh, cycle that started back in 2010, or actually technically in the middle of 20, uh, 2009, at the end of the Great Recession. So with the official peak being determined, at that point, it's a downturn. So technically, you're entering into recessionary uh, time period. Now, you've probably heard me tell the story that this same group, uh, after the Great Recession, they officially declared that the Great Recession of us uh, ended in June of 2009, but it wasn't until October of 2010 that they actually made that announcement. So you have to understand that economists are not only lousy forecasters, uh, hell, they can't even predict the past. So, so you have to understand it, but this is where we're going. I don't think anybody would uh, argue with the fact that come March and particularly on into April, uh, that everything went down and declined. Uh, so how bad is it? The, the pandemic, uh, according to the Congressional Budget Office, is going to probably cost us about $8 trillion over the next 10 years. Uh, that's a generally rough estimate. I don't know how that's going to work out. Unemployment claims, uh, we've been watching those weekly. I'm sure a lot of you have. Uh, through the latest week available is July 4th. About 50 million people around the country have filed for unemployment insurance. That's about a third of all the people working. Uh, out of 150 million people working, about 50 have uh, filed for the unemployment insurance. In Texas, uh, our filings have totaled to about 2.8, just under 3 million, about 20, a little over 21 percent of the jobs. Oil prices, you know, Texas has been hit with the double whammy. I mean, not only have been fighting the virus, but even just a month or two before the virus effects really took into play, 
uh, uh, we had the oil price decline. And in fact, in April, as you know, in one day, those few, the price of oil actually dipped down to a negative 30 something dollars a barrel because producers were having to pay people to take the oil off of their hand. Uh, that was just a one day, incidentally, uh, uh, circumstance and because of the futures market. But it's still nevertheless true that the oil price has been running uh, 30 to $40 a barrel here lately. Actually, in the last two, three weeks, it's been hovering right around the $40. It's been plus or minus about a dollar or two around the $40 mark. And quite honestly, that isn't enough. Uh, that's not enough for the fracking industry. It's not enough for most of the producers to make a profit. And as you all know, that uh, if, a, if a business can't make a profit, it doesn't last very long. We've got, uh, and this is a biggie here, uh, we've got nearly 5 million mortgages across the country that have applied for and are receiving uh, some type of mortgage payment forbearance uh, where lenders and servicers are allowing uh, uh, mortgage payments to be deferred, uh, uh, avoided. It's a little, about around 9% of the total. And, and uh, it was trending downward. I got to tell you, though, the, the, the last week's number, and like I say, these things change virtually weekly. Uh, last week actually bumped up again. It looks like maybe we're going to go through another, uh, another round here of, of some, some numbers instead of trending downward, maybe having a little bit of a bump up. I, I'll show you some others here in just a little bit. But uh, uh, the forbearance is a big issue. Technically, the, the uh, borrowers were allowed to uh, request forbearance for up to a year if they wanted to. But in general, uh, most people figured it would end sometime here this summer or this fall. Don't know how that's going to work. There's been, as you well know, uh, a lot of misinformation and, and confusion about how payments are to be made up and, and what they have to be done a lump sum or whatever, extending the loan. Those things are still going to be worked out. But I'm going to come back to the forbearance issue uh, a little bit later on. Then finally, the big thing, of course, that we're all aware of is the federal deficit is just growing and growing and going out of, out of style. Uh, we're going to reach at least a trillion dollars this year. That's a one trillion dollars this year that the federal government is going to have to borrow. Uh, and incidentally, it's interesting to me uh, watching the media and stuff because they always describe the things like the PPP and the extended benefits for the unemployment, the $600 a, a week and so forth, which have been uh, absolutely necessary payments, really. But they've been being described as stimulus payments. They're not stimulus payments at all. They're survival payments. They're trying to get the economy to simply survive here in a short run, short run being defined as maybe a couple of quarters, and then, and then uh, hopefully be able to recover on its own. So we're going to have to see for the first time or for the first time since the end of World War II, uh, the federal debt is now greater than the annual GDP, and we're going to, it'll take us forever. Our, our grandchildren are going to be paying uh, for some of this later on. Uh, I'm going to jump right into what I think a recovery might look like and, and what it's going to take to have recovery. And, and incidentally, there's no common definition of recovery. Uh, you know, do we have to go back to exactly what we had before the pandemic or do we have to be uh, somewhere different or whatever? The key and the, the top line, and after that, you don't even have to read the rest of it, but jobs and spending. It's going to be the pace of recovery is going to be dependent upon how fast we get all of these people, these 50 million people, roughly, plus or minus, uh, that, that have filed for unemployment back onto uh, payrolls and back into jobs and back into earning income to, make, to buy things and make payments and so forth. And then secondly, what they're going to do with the money, how they're going to spend it, what it's going to be spent on. Uh, consumer spending and the pace of consumer spending. And then even for those of you in the retail business and retail real estate, just how they spend and where they spend. We have sped up, of course, the e-commerce uh, section. 
E-commerce uh, in the last uh, decade basically has grown from about 5% to roughly 10% or 12% of total retail sales. That has accelerated now to close to 15 to 20% and, and may go on uh, more than that. The recovery is going to break out short, long, medium, long run. That you, you could have figured that out without me telling you that. Uh, we, we ended the second quarter. We're just beginning to start seeing second quarter uh, numbers. They're not out officially yet completely, uh, GDP and so forth. But those are the, uh, that's the worst on record. I gave you the buzzword a little while ago. When we get the second quarter numbers, man, they are going to be bad. And I'm going to show you some graphs here in charts in a minute. But the third quarter, the fourth quarter, the second half of this year, and on into the first and second quarter of next year, that medium term, the six to 12 months out, those are going to be critical in terms of our pace and the strength of recovery and how fast we get back. Long run, we're looking to see what happens. Uh, uh, the, 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 the real estate markets are going to be affected. The business markets are going to be affected. Banking and financial markets, capital markets are going to be affected. We're just, we're just trying to figure out that I'm going to make some reference to what I'm going to, what I'm looking for and just thinking about in terms of long run secular changes. Job recovery by industry, of course, is going to be very uneven. The services sectors, uh, that have been hit so hard, the tourism, the restaurants, uh, all of those kinds of, of uh, activities. And of course, for those of you here in real estate, most of, the, most of those folks being affected that hard are at renters rather than homeowners. So we're having to see. Housing has done real well, and Roxanne made reference to it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, tell you and show you some numbers that uh, agree with that. Uh, and housing, we are, we're very hopeful. Uh, it's not a prediction, but it's a hopeful that housing will be a leader in bringing us back and bringing the economy back. Uh, obviously, low interest rates are going to help, but it's going to be uh, also the jobs and money. Corporate real estate or commercial real estate, I should say, uh, that recovery is going to be really mixed by type and location. Industrial space is doing real well. Obviously, hotels and retail not doing so well, and offices on the bubble. Uh, it's very hard to tell really right now how well office is going to rebound, uh, particularly as more and more of us and industries and businesses learn that it is entirely possible for people to work at home and, and telework and telecommute uh, and still be productive and still get uh, things done. So. We don't know. We've gone through these cycles before. I, 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 for those of you who've been around long enough, you know that it's always it's come up about every eight or nine years, and and uh, some some issue about telecommuting and so forth to get rid of uh, commuting to get people off of the roads and, and avoid the one and two hour commutes trying to get to work. But that this time it may have more impact because we were forced into having to do it at least for this this period of time, and we're still basically into it uh, where people are doing. And then lastly, uh, the, what the recovery, the capital markets, there's gonna be some major shift and some potential problems. The big, the big uh, uh, cloud on the horizon right now is, not, is sovereign debt, it's about <clears throat> government debt, not only US, but around the world. <clears throat> and then also corporate debt. Uh, corporate America has gotten over levered, much like the housing market and households, got over levered in buying homes with uh, the, the funny money back in 2002, three, four, five, and six. Uh, corporate debt has gotten out of whack. Another good economic technical term, we're just out of whack instead of being in whack. But corporate America went out, got heavy into debt, uh, low interest rate, low interest cost. But the problem was corporate America didn't take those borrowings and invest the borrowings into productive activities they went into financial management, buying back stock, uh, uh, manipulating stock prices, uh, paying dividends, et cetera. And, and that, that, uh, that chicken's going to come home to roost here some, sometime. Here's some just, I'm going to give you some quick, uh, quick uh, looks. Restaurant bookings, I mean, there's no secret. You guys know this as well as I do. Uh, 
Uh, people aren't going to restaurants, restaurants, in fact, they can't because the restaurants are not allowed to have full, uh, full f on capacity. Uh, they can do drive by and take out. Now, of course, you can do seated, uh, but with 25 to 50 percent uh, occupancy. And of course, right now here in Texas, uh, even that is going to be dubious for the next uh, month or so, as we have had a, a uh, uptick in the in the virus. Incidentally, before I go any further. All of the economic stuff that you're going to hear about here this morning is all still dependent on the virus. It, it, it's going to be the health effect and whether or not we get the virus under control. And nothing is really going to return to quote unquote normal until or unless we have a, a vaccine that, that actually works and is universally available and doesn't cost an arm and a leg to get. And until or unless we get to there, nothing is ever going to come back to exactly what it was before. So, so take all everything you hear uh, with that in mind. But the restaurant bookings and so forth, uh, this is from Open Table. Hotel occupancy rates uh, running just a little over 40%. The hotels can't operate at that. In fact, they have trouble operating really at 60%. They need to be about closer to 72 to 75%. Uh, on ADR, but but uh, 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 occupancy, but but uh, that doesn't work either. The airlines are in a world of hurt. <laughs> their their passenger traffic is is way 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 down. Uh, down it, it, it's 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 finally gotten back to only being down eighty percent instead of close to a hundred percent. There I have seen here lately that there is been, has been some uh, increase, and you can see the little tick up in, in travel. Uh, but again, it's, uh, the airlines, of, of course, cannot survive uh, for very long at, at uh, 70 or 80 percent of the demand they've had. Here's what's happened nationally in terms of those unemployment claims. You, you're probably seeing this in the, in the paper and on the newscast. And yes, it's trended down, but even at, even last the, the last week we have available, which was the week of July 4th, it was a million three uh, unemployment claims. That's still, you know, eight times, nine times bigger than what the average weekly claim rate was before the pandemic. It's it's still out of sight. I mean, of course, the the seven nearly seven million <coughs> back in March was nuts, but but. Um, until we get this number back down to something uh, looking like the 200 to 220,000 uh, number that we were that we were running during the quote unquote the good times, uh, it, it's 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 still not working. In April alone, we lost 20 and a half million jobs, 50 million claims uh, being made. May uh, the official numbers we added 2.7. June added almost 5 million. So. We've added close to eight of the 20 million jobs that were lost in April. That means we're still way behind the, 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 the eight ball on all of that. Unemployment rate has jumped from right around 4% to nearly 12. It's 11.1, I think, uh, officially. Uh, some of the numbers and, and the unemployment and employment numbers from BLS, they acknowledge that the numbers are a bit misleading because Things are in such a state of, of flux and the way they measure things, the way things are taken and so forth, uh, they admit that these numbers are, are a little shaky, but they're the best we've got. So, so we're, we're looking at it. One of the big things is continued unemployment. I mean, the idea is to get back to that March level where we had about a million seven people uh, on the unemployment rolls uh, claiming insurance. And instead, right now, we're 10 times more than that. We're up over 18 million. So, so again, there, as we've heard uh, in the last three or four months, we're trying to flatten the curve or, or lower the curve. This is one of those curves that we're trying to flatten and lower and get it back down to that. And you can just see the rate of decline there. While at least it is declining, it isn't going very fast. And it doesn't look like it's good. You'd, you'd like for it to uh, come down about as fast as it went up between uh, March 21st and, and May 2nd. But anyway, we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, here, I'm, here's a summary of all of that. Uh, April was 14.7. Uh, June is 11.1. I've mentioned that. 
CPI, the big, maybe the good news uh, from the Fed standpoint and the people that are, that are watching uh, monetary policy is that, of course, one of the big concerns was that we would enter into a period of deflation where we would have negative inflation rate. Uh, and we did in April. Uh, in May, it came back up and, and the CPI number just came out uh, this, uh, yesterday. Uh, it's back up again. So it looks like it just back up to sort of that 1%, one and a half percent level uh, for an annual basis, which is not very much. It really isn't enough, but at least it's not negative and, and at least prices are not declining. De de deceleration, deflation, is, is a much bigger problem in some respects than inflation because it's very difficult to fight against it. It's very difficult to change it. About the only way you can do it is to keep pumping money into the economy, which of course is what the government has been doing with the CARES Act, with the PPP, with the unemployment insurance uh, benefit boost and so forth. And that actually total personal income has actually increased the last couple of months, but Spending has not, and what has happened is people are saving it. The savings rate went from like 6% to 33%. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. And again, I, I said earlier that recovery is going to depend on jobs and spending. And spending is what do we do with income and what do we do with our money uh, as, as, it, as we get it and, and if we're going to take it uh, out of our savings. One of the big challenges to get out of all of this is the workers who either don't want to come back to work or can't come back to work. Uh, right now, we've got a, a whole host of people, uh, particularly at the lower uh, hourly weight, uh, uh, wage rate scales, that uh, discover that with the unemployment benefit uh, supplements with the 600 bucks a week, that they're actually getting paid better to not work than they were to get work. And so the, 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 it's been interesting that that's become a, now an issue of, of, uh, and a concern of whether or not people will actually want to come back. And the unemployment benefit uh, uh, add-on is supposed to expire the end of this month. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, the legislature, the, uh, the Congress, extends that or, or does something with it. But the other problem, of course, is a lot of people might not be able to because they can't handle the child care. What, what are we going to do if the schools don't reopen? Uh, child care centers, daycare centers, et cetera, have been forced to close down. Uh, what, what do you do with your kids <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to go back to work? Uh, and, and I know I talked to a lot of people who would like to go back to work to get away from the kids, but they, they, you can't. Uh, you still got to take care of them. So we'll have to see how that goes. And, uh, but it, it's all part and parcel. There, there's no segmenting all this because everything is kind of related. Here's uh, a, 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 an article that came out of the Wall Street Journal I thought was very interesting. Uh, one of the other issues we're going to be facing here in the, in the medium term, the six to 12 month recovery process that I, I mentioned here a little while ago, and that is that a lot of the businesses that have been forced to close their doors uh, and, and stop, it's going to be problematic of how many of those businesses really are going to wind up being closed permanently, that they're simply not going to be able uh, to, cut, to come back and, and reopen, which means also rehire and put people back to work. Uh, and and uh, this was uh, the estimate that came out uh, from the Wall Street Journal. And you can see how it looks when I mean, restaurants, shopping and retail, all of the clothing stores, for example, and all of, of most of the stores and, and most all of the shopping centers, the, the big malls particularly, uh, have left uh, uh, everybody hurting. They're, they're, they've had to close down. The malls are closed down. And it's going to be debatable and, and real problematic of how many of these are actually going to be able to come back. More than half the restaurants in the United States that have been forced to close down probably or possibly might not ever reopen. As all of you in the business world know, the number one reason for a failure of a business generally or to close down is, is a lack of capital, inadequate capital base. 
And most of these kinds of companies and businesses, small businesses, uh, uh, generally not uh, heavily capitalized, not a lot of retained earnings, not a lot of savings to back up and make it through a really bad time. And this is not just a slowdown, this was a stoppage. So it's really think the beauty, the beauty salons, the spas, the, the barber shops and so forth, fitness centers and so forth. This, I just thought it was interesting. To, and, and whether these numbers are exactly correct or not, it gives you an idea of perspective uh, of what it might look like. The Federal Reserve in their June policy report, they put out a report every month and this was a, a particularly good one. I normally don't pay that much attention to, it, to tell you the truth uh, because it's generally more political than anything else. But uh, uh, I thought they did uh, put out some good points. First of all, and number one, and this one is number one, the pandemic remains highly uncertain. It, it, it's obvious that we don't have control of the virus. We don't have control of the number of new cases. We don't have control of uh, hospitalization. The, the virus is highly contagious. Uh, people are tired of being cooped up in their houses, so they're getting out. Uh, there, there's sort of a mixed bag of, of uh, adhering to the recommendations from the healthcare uh, industry of how to take care of ourselves. As we all know, Texas, started out in March and April and even into early part of May, Texas had been relatively lightly hit uh, with the virus, especially as compared to New York and the Northeast and, and some of the other areas. So we were all feeling pretty good and pretty confident about ourselves and, and thinking that things were going really well. Well, it turns out that now we are the hot spot. It's, it's shifted. Uh, Florida, of course, California, Arizona, uh, Texas, some of the, the, you know, the southern states that have reopened Georgia uh, ha have now experienced now the rapid increase in the number of cases. The only maybe good news is the death rate has not dramatically increased, but with the number of cases, even a constant death rate, there are more people being seriously affected. So all of that being said, we've had a collapse in demand across the board. There was a collapse in demand for oil, which was the leading cause for the oil prices to go down, but a collapse in demand for almost everything else. Uh, you didn't go out shopping, you didn't buy things, didn't go for a while, you didn't go to the restaurant, you didn't, yeah, all you did was buy groceries and kind of hunker down and, and make your utility payments. So ultimately, uh, uh, we're gonna start seeing as these, comp these businesses don't reopen, we are going to see a, an increase that hadn't started yet, but prediction probably in the next six to 12 months, that increase in bankruptcies is gonna start. It'll be in the energy industry, but it's gonna be sort of across the board. There was a change in the bankruptcy laws here, uh, actually ironically in February, that makes it easier for the very small companies to file a bankruptcy claim, uh, get a little better protection, even protect some equity, uh, and, and be able to, to uh, get over the, the economic consequences a little easier, but we're gonna see it. It hadn't happened yet. You haven't seen it yet, but it's, it's probably uh, coming. One of the big things that's different about this, this go round, this economic activity and service, the downturn in our economy is that it's been a lot in the services activity. That's hit actually harder and service, the hotels, the restaurants, and, and, and business services across the board uh, have been hit just as hard or harder than the manufacturing, because most of our past recessions we've measured in terms of manufacturing, uh, output, industrial production, uh, jobs, and so forth, but, the, but this is all different. And now, trying to restart and reopen the economy with the social distancing and, and, and uh, the recovery and, the, and the, the getting together and so forth. There's so many businesses that you don't think of that require, or, or at least historically have required, you know, face-to-face, -to -face, close together uh, interaction uh, that now becomes much more difficult, problematic, and potentially dangerous uh, in terms of getting the virus. So, so it'll be interesting uh, to see that. We're, we're, 
this is different. This is the reason the economists don't really have a good handle on how to how to get a handle on what the future might look like uh, on some of this disruption in global trade, exports, imports. It's just all over. That's that's fine. Inflationary expectations. Uh, the, the central bank is going to target inflation. They really would like inflation to be around 2%. It isn't going to make it this year. We'll have to see. And then, of course, fiscal policies. The federal government is going to continue to give out money. Uh, and, and, and the debt level for the sovereign governments is going to keep going. Let me give you a couple of things. Consumer confidence uh, obviously dropped off the cliff. In fact, almost all of these slides, you're going to see how out at the far right-hand side, is going to look like uh, everything is falling off the cliff, which basically it did. Uh, but it is showing some uptick. Uh, expectations, uh, which is a different measure that the conference board does. This is the overall uh, confidence that I've got graphed here. But they have another one that they, they uh, a part of the survey on future expectations. And that index actually uh, was back up. Consumers seem to be relatively optimistic about the, the near term future, the next several months on out. Now, this survey is now a, a, about 30, 40 days old. They're going to release some new data here not uh, pretty soon. It didn't out yet. That's the reason I'm telling you some of this stuff changes from week to week. But, uh, but uh, it, it does look like as a, as a population group, as a, as a society, we are relatively optimistic that we're going to get out of this doldrum and get out of this uh, self-induced recession and, and uh, downturn and come back up to something approaching uh, where we were, and that we're going to do it within a reasonable period of time. Now, that doesn't mean next month or maybe even the next uh, quarter, but sometime in the next three, four quarters, uh, something on that order. Retail sales, of course, plummeted in March and April. May came back up. Uh, June numbers will be out. I think it's next week or the week after. Uh, so we don't know, but but uh, so we're seeing. And you can see what the change in retail sales typically look like, uh, all the way back to 2010. So I mean, you know, it's it's uh, the these changes, these radical changes that we've seen here in March, April, and May, and June will be similar. Uh, are just unprecedented. And again, the economists don't know how to interpret all of this when you have such an anomaly going on uh, in, in these kinds of things. The small business optimism index of, of uh, the small businesses, this is the one that I just, re, uh, it, it came out this morning, uh, went back up to 100 uh, to, to uh, this level. So we, we're, we're seeing a little bit of a rebound uh, come back up and, and do this. Interest rates, you're all aware that right now we're running at historically low interest rates. The 30-year fixed mortgage rate, the black line, and these are monthly, so it hadn't hit the 3% mark yet, but it's going that way. It's going to get there. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, quite frankly, it's, it's literally already there. I think you can get a 30-year fixed rate if you have a really good outstanding uh, FICA score and 20% and down, you probably can get 3% uh, or a little better if you shop around. Uh, obviously, if you do a 15-year mortgage, you're, you're getting under 3% already, probably at uh, two and seven eighths or, or maybe even two and three quarters uh, and thereabouts. The green line is the federal funds rate. That's the Fed rate that you hear about so much. Uh, that's going to continue. It's going to look like it did back over to the left. It's going to be down near zero and just stay there uh, at least for the next year or so because the Fed is not, is not going to raise rates uh, unless something really, really dramatic happens in terms of recovery and inflation gets out of hand. But, but that is so unlikely uh, that we, that's, that's uh, not really in the game plan right now. And the 10-year Treasury uh, you can see it's bouncing around. It's been bouncing around at about 0.6% uh, in that vicinity for the last, uh, really for the last several weeks and doesn't show any inclination to come back up. Uh, a lot of the 10-year uh, comparable rates around the world are actually negative. Uh, the Fed has said that they are not going to go into negative rate territory. We'll take them at their word for the time being that they're not going to do that. But I think the, uh, the, 
the 30 year fixed mortgage rate, you know, can still probably have a little bit more uh, downward slide to it. Uh, and that's one of the good news here, of course, for all of you uh, that are involved in the housing sector, that, that, uh, that interest rate is going to be very attractive. It is attractive right now. Uh, a lot of the lenders are actually having the biggest problem is handling also the refi along with the new, new purchase applications, uh, just the sheer volume of business and being able to process everything. And also, a lot of lenders are getting a little nervous. Uh, we're, they're aware of all this forbearance out there. They're aware that a lot of these people who have been laid off and who maybe have still even made their mortgage payments, if they don't get rehired, or if one of the spouses don't get rehired in a family situation, uh, that, that we, could, we could see another round of foreclosures coming, and I think that's probably likely. I don't normally include this in my, in my uh, presentation, presentation to talk about global effect, but, but the, you can just see how the pandemic has affected the whole world. The advanced economies are projected to only be, to, to decline by about 8% this year. Uh, the U.S. at 8%, the European area around 10%, uh, uh, United Kingdom, Great Britain around 10%. It, it, it's not good news. And then the, the, the real kicker here is those emerging markets. We've been looking at China and India and Russia and Brazil and, and, and the Mideast and the Southeast Asian areas as being the stimulus for global growth because that's where most of the the net increase in demand for goods and services and oil and everything else really come from because the advanced economies are fairly stable and, and kind of inelastic, if you will, on the demand side. But, uh, but uh, the, the emerging markets are, are really, they're getting hit with the pandemic. Africa is getting hit now. South America, as you well know, is getting hit very hard. Uh, Brazil's getting hit very hard. Uh, with the with the uh, COVID uh, issue with the virus, and, and that's going to take its toll uh, there on on these areas. Now, 2021 is projected. This is the International Monetary Fund projections, incidentally, the IMF. Uh, that 2021 is projected to be better years. Obviously, much better because it turns around and becomes positive. But like, look at the United States. If we go down 8% this year and we only come back up 4.8% the next year, we aren't back to where we started. <laughs> if you go down 8% the way the percentages work and change rate of changes, you've got to have a bounce back of nearly 15%, 14, 15% to just break even with the 8% decline. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how these things uh, play out and, and it is a global, you know, the, the world keeps getting smaller. The economies are interrelated. The, the recovery is going to be interrelated. The U.S. can't recover completely and, and totally without the rest of the world recovering just as well. So that's the reason why it becomes important. Second quarter of this year, the best guess is, and that's all it is, is a guess, is that it's gonna be about a negative 30%. We'll see that number here in the next few weeks. Uh, uh, the the uh, April, May, June time period we know is gonna be the worst on record. That was, you saw that buzzword there on my title slide. This is what I was talking about. First quarter was down about 5%. Second quarter is gonna be down somewhere around 30%. Uh, again, I, I got that from looking at, at surveys of, of economists from around the country of what they thought. And this is sort of the average uh, of what was projected. Uh, uh, one of the big banks just came out here last week with their projection. They were predicting 35%. So we, it, we'll have to see what's going on. And you can see how we were running the, the past several quarters uh, back to the second quarter, 16. So. Uh, you know, we were running two, two, two and a half percent. Uh, the economy was doing really, really well. And in fact, the economy was really doing well most of the first quarter of this year until March. <coughs> March was bad enough to cause us to go down 5%. So uh, it, it's just a matter of coming back. Let's talk about Texas. Texas was looking promising. The recent results here, the last couple of three weeks, 
have made uh, our, our future a little bit more problematic. Unemployment claims have bounced back up here the last week that we have data for. <coughs> we went back up to nearly 130,000. We had kind of leveled off in that mid 80s. But again, look back over to the left and you can see that the normal quote unquote uh, unemployment claims were in the 12, 13, 14, 15,000 range. And so we're 10 times, uh, roughly 10 times the, the number of unemployment uh, insurance claims coming here. Here's what it looks like. Austin has lost somewhere just shy of 200,000 jobs between March 21st and June 27th. The uh, MSA data runs a little later, so we don't have it it's quite as current. Uh, so probably that number, by the time we get up here to the end of July, that 167,000 is going to be probably close to 200,000 jobs having been lost in the MSA. This is the Austin Round Rock MSA. You can see Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, Houston around 600,000. It's, it's uh, really bad. Uh, the, they, these are the unemployment insurance claims that have been made. These are the official numbers. I'm telling you, the numbers don't balance the way that the, they're counted. So somewhere around a half a million jobs in Dallas and Houston, 160,000 in Austin, close to 200,000. So we'll, we'll see, and this is just year over year. This is, uh, uh, I think this was uh, May uh, this year compared to May of last year in the, in the, uh, uh, number of employed. Austin uh, actually is doing better than the other MSAs in the state in terms of its overall unemployment rate. Uh, incidentally, uh, I, I guess we should mention it somewhere. Uh, Austin, uh, I saw where the school district down there has approved the uh, tax abatement for the Tesla plant. I, I don't know how much uh, uh, we should get too excited about that yet to see whether they're actually coming or whether that's just a lot of uh, uh, negotiating posture. Uh, I, I'm aware of it, we're aware of it, we're watching it. I don't think anybody really knows what's gonna happen with that. Uh, the Texas Economic Leading Index put out by the Dallas Fed, there's another one of your graphs that looks like it just fell off a cliff, which it did. Uh, and it looks very much like that fall off we had during the Great Recession back in 2008 and nine. So, uh, it will take us a while to, to bounce back from that. The, uh, the energy industry has been hit very, very hard. The current rig count is running about uh, just over 100 rigs, you know, down from, from almost uh, 500 rigs, over 500 rigs uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is uh, going to continue to continue to uh, occur. The, the overall demand, this is what I was talking about, those emerging countries, the overall demand for oil globally has declined nearly 20 million barrels a day. U.S. production of oil has declined about 2 million barrels a day. We've gone from about 13 million to about 11 million barrels a day of output and production. The price of oil did bounce back, at least bounce back into the 40s. But again, you can see if you, if you look back into 18 and 19, the years uh, there on the graph, the price of oil needs to be somewhere, you know, between 50, 60 bucks a barrel uh, for, the, for the fracking industry to do well. And, and uh, even at that price, you can see the rig count did have a downward trend to it. So we're not looking for, this is gonna take a while. Uh, this is going to take a while and the, the energy industry is going to be very different. We're having a staged or phased reopening of the economy and it's gonna take many months. Uh, this was based of course on the governor's program. As you well know, the phase three has been suspended uh, and it looks like that we may be in the, in the process here in the short run of taking two steps forward and one step back and two steps forward and one step back uh, as, we, as we fight because again, the, the overriding uh, all of the economic issues is the health issues and the virus and getting the virus under control. Job recovery being brought back, uh, willingness to come back, ability to come back, consumer attitudes, businesses. Uh, we know that there are going to be businesses that are going to wind up being permanently closed 
I, I, and I uh, introduced the concept, uh, Texas is well known as being a very entrepreneurial state. Uh, uh, lack of government control regulations makes it easy to start a business relatively in Texas. Uh, we have relatively low taxes uh, for business uh, operations. So we it'd be interesting to see all those businesses that may not come back, all the restaurants that may fail, et cetera, Will other people come along and entrepreneurs and take up the slack and reopen or open new new businesses to, to replace the ones that don't come back? Have to wait and see on that. I suspect we will see that, but that's probably at least six months to 12 months to 18 months out. First of all, the banks are gonna to have to be willing to make business loans. And right now, I don't think that they're in that mode uh, of looking at new business uh, creation as being a really uh, a sound banking move. The energy market is gonna be definitely changed. We're gonna see a lot of uh, bankruptcies and a lot of the uh, uh, wildcatters and speculative businesses, energy businesses going out of business. We'll see it concentrated into the, the big boys, the guys who have the capital capacity. Uh, they can weather these kinds of storms and in fact, take advantage of them. Housing, we, I, I'm going to get to housing in a minute, if I can. Uh, it's going to rebound. We're expecting it to rebound. And, and as uh, Roxanne made reference to, it, it's doing quite well right now. We expect that to continue. One of the negatives here is going to be state and local government budgets are getting decimated. Uh, this is going to be a problem for the next two, three, four years. Uh, state, county, city, all of them, all of the tax revenue sources, of course, I've just dropped off the table and, and expenditures and requirements for services have picked up. So we're gonna to have to see. Let me jump into real estate because we, we're gonna run out of time here in a minute. Uh, the share of loans and forbearance, as I mentioned about a minute ago, had been declining. Uh, last week, it actually bounced up a little bit. It'll be interesting to see over the next several weeks uh, whether that uh, continues to, that share decline uh, continues or whether it uh, goes up again. New home sales in May were, were up 16%. Uh, Existing home sales, though, declined. A lot of that is uh, people deciding not to sell and, and taking listings. I can tell you, that, and I'll show you the data here in a minute, uh, the active and new listings are way down. That's going to, that obviously, you, you can't sell product if you have no product to sell. So, so we're seeing that across the board. That could change very easily. Nevertheless, median home prices are still holding up. They're actually going up. Mortgage rates, of course, are at all time low. Housing starts have been at a low. We are expecting those to start picking up and we're hearing reports locally that, that the home builders are beginning to pick back up and build more units. I can tell you though, at the national level, it, it's been down, but at the local level, Austin uh, home building has been pretty good. Here's what it looks like graphically. The existing home sales, the dark line, the blue line going down, uh, the orange line, the new home sales actually ticking back up a little bit, but you can see that they had fallen off back in, uh, in uh, April, uh, February and April, uh, and February and March, and so, and then April, and then so May, May had a little uptick on it, uh, but it's not there yet. Home purchase applications, though, have been going up, and this is one of those leading indexes that we do watch. Uh, this is not closing, so these are not sales. This is simply mortgage applications for people that are making an application for a purchase mortgage for a single family home. Uh, as reported by the Mortgage Bankers Association, and that's up about 20% after, after basically falling off the cliff back in April and May. So we're, we expected and saw that June sales have been up. We're expecting July sales when we report closed sales here in the next month or so uh, for July. We expect those to be up. And then, then, then it, it's going to be a little bit problematic on into September, October, November, uh, because that's typically our down season anyway, as schools get started and so forth. The Home Builders Index they, they is back up, even though starts are down, uh, but the Home Builders are reporting more optimism. They were reporting 
uh, increase in foot traffic and showings uh, and people coming through. So again, that's the, the blue line there. It bounced back up. It fell off the cliff uh, going from, you know, almost 80 down to 30. This is just a relative measure with 50 being in the middle. Uh, and it's 50% or more of the home builders surveyed said yes or no. Uh, so, so you see that that is getting better. Here's, here's, I'm going to go through this real quick. March was the last of the good months. And in fact, March, because of the last week or two, didn't really pan out that well. Sales were only up 1.5% across the state. In Austin, they were up a little over 2%. Uh, what I'd really take your attention to is over on the far right, the month's inventory is still extremely tight. Normally, we expect that to be about six months. Uh, the active listings you can see across the board are down in all of the MSAs. And then April was even worse. April was the real, a real tough month. Sales down 18, 20, 21%, 22%. Uh, active listings still continuing to go negative, but the month's inventory is still tight and median and average price is still showing positive uh, gains. May, again, probably our, our worst month so far. So right now we're calling May the bottom, but we'll have to see how we do here in the next three or four months. But it, uh, you know, down across the state, over 23%, uh, Austin down almost 30% in terms of sales volume reported. Even the average price, that average medium price there, there was a shift in the distribution of the properties being bought and sold. So it changed the averages and medians, maybe more than the actual change in values uh, going on. The, the, the upper, upper end market kind of uh, slowed down considerably and the lower end market, uh, the 200 uh, to 300 in the, in the outlying areas, around city of Austin. This again is MSA. So this is including the multi-county area. Uh, the lower priced uh, homes uh, market uh, actually did a pickup. So it was, it was a mixed bag, but it, it did cause the average and median compared to the year before, compared to uh, 2019 to actually down. June is, is, is actually a bounce back month, 14% uh, across the board. Uh, Austin is up. Nine uh, percent uh, are better, but I still draw your attention to the active listings and uh, statewide down 22 percent in Austin down almost 32 percent or more than 32 percent. Average and medium prices still up, but months inventory less than two months. I got to tell you, in Aggie speak, you just ain't got none. Uh, it, it's that, that's going to be a limiting factor here for the for the next uh, quarter going forward uh, is to induce people to be uh, active in selling their houses. Here's what it looks like around the community and around in the MS, this is the MSA, uh, the multi-county area. The dark green means that uh, sales on the left uh, were up 11% or more. The light green uh, sales also were up, but between one and 10%. Uh, a little bit of slowdown, uh, up in the uh, uh, Georgetown, Pflugerville, and, and, and up uh, I-35 a little bit. That, but, but that was such a hot market a year ago uh, that it, it perhaps not surprising that it might show a little bit of slowdown. Uh, down towards San Marcos, uh, pick up in sales. But you can see on the right-hand side, uh, average prices in here, uh, we think this is a more uh, meaningful measure this is price per square foot, or the average closed price per square foot of the house sold. And you can see just across the board, it was all positive, all increasing. Uh, if, if so far there has been no evidence, direct evidence, at a broad base level of any kind of negative impact on prices of the virus. Now, my guess is, and I'm sure all of you can hit me, with all kinds of exceptions by individual neighborhoods or, or, or particular street or community uh, where in a local, very localized area, uh, perhaps there have been some negative value impacts, but I can tell you statistically at looking at the MLS data that's been reported. And of course, remember we get everything geocoded so we know where it is uh, geographically. Uh, we haven't seen that kind of thing. 
I, I, I stole your uh, <laughs> infographic from the uh, ABOR. Uh, this is the MSA of course. You can get these infographics yourselves uh, from ABOR on the various uh, sub-markets, but uh, you'll see that the median home price is up. In fact, the median home price uh, jumped up pretty good. Uh, closed sales up 9%. This is, this is similar data to what I've shown you. It, there's always a little bit of difference in all of our reporting of data, depending on just what day we close the books and, and report the data. So sometimes there's a slight difference, but, but we're seeing across the board average days on the market, 44 days, uh, very tight market contending. Uh, one of the things I would point out there is the pending sales are up 33%. That's our best leading indicator, if you will, of what we think July is going to look like. And then, but I also point out the, the, the statistic there to the left of it, the active listings and the new listings are both down, active listings down almost a third. Uh, that does not pretend well uh, for the fall if we can't get those active listings to come back up and, and look at and see what we're doing. We run a uh, home price index where we measure uh, change in prices based on repeat sales, the same house selling again a second or third time. And we, we, we take it back over several years. So we know, it, and, and it tries to account for uh, not averages and medians, but the, but the real change in, a, in the same property over time and hopefully keeping the, the quality of the property and so forth uh, constant. Obviously, if it's a long period of time, there may be in remodeling and that's tough to take into account. We also break it out between the bottom third, the middle third, and the top third by price category. So these by price tiers, the lower price properties you can see have been uh, increasing at a little bit faster pace uh, in terms of going up. Uh, the middle price market has gone up higher than anybody else, uh, and, but the, the higher price market uh, tends to show a little bit of decline, but it gives you a good idea. Uh, you can see that 2019, in terms of, these are all positive. These are all, you know, between three and 4%, even at the lowest point, and going on up over 6% per year. Uh, so it's all positive. It's just a relative positives, and you can kind of get a feel for what the year-over-year -year growth by price tier looks like. Here's a lot of detail uh, for those of you who want to look at your individual sub-markets or counties. Uh, I appreciate ABOR sending me this. We had it as well and allowing me to put it out on our, on our uh, presentation. I'm not going to dwell on it. For those of you who get a copy of the, of the slides here, you'll have this table uh, and be able to kind of study it to your heart's content. Uh, what you'll see, though, is that some of the, the outlying counties, uh, Bastrop Hayes, uh, uh, are doing, uh, uh, picked up and doing very, very well, mainly because of price. I think you see the price affordability when you look at that median price on there has become attractive. And it's also been a factor uh, because of the virus that people are trying to, it appears, maybe moving out of the uh, centralized urban areas and moving to the suburbs and even to the exurbs, to the smaller communities, uh, to get away from the high density uh, areas. One of the things we're seeing is lending is getting tidy, tighter. Uh, this was a survey by the Home Builders Association. Uh, I thought it was interesting that almost a third of the, of the lenders that they surveyed just simply said they weren't making any new AD and C loans. And this is gonna be something we're gonna have to take a look at. Uh, I don't know exactly in Austin area whether it's happening, but I would suspect so because the lenders are getting pressure from the regulators to not make risky loans, uh, whereas on the other side, they're being encouraged to make uh, home loans. So they're, they're really being dragged uh, and stretched in both directions. But, but it's interesting that and it, it, is a, it appears to be that the lending is going to get real tight for construction lending and especially for the AD and C, the acquisition development and construction loans that development requires uh, to take raw land and convert it into developed properties. Just to give you some, what I think about the future, uh, I don't know if this is the end of the urbanization movement in the US, I doubt it, 
but I think we're going to see it substantially slow down. Uh, the millennials are getting – one of the things millennials I, – I, I didn't hit you with my normal demographics here today, but one of the things the millennials are learning to their chagrin is that they're going to age and they're getting older. And they're now hitting that <laughs> – they're now hitting the mid to late 30s. And, and now with the virus and the life changes of getting married and having families, the movement out of the uh, high-density urban areas into the suburbs, that sort of Again, home affordability is part of the driving factor there. Uh, we're also seeing increased demand for different kinds of houses. Houses with more rooms, dedicated, in fact, now the last thing I heard was that a lot of uh, buyers with new, looking for new homes uh, are asking the builders to build two offices, not one, because if both the husband and wife are gonna be working from home, they don't wanna work in the same room, so they're gonna see that. And then, of course, we, we have now the, uh, the PC, we're going to call them primary bedrooms instead of master bedrooms, and, and homes with multiple primary bedrooms, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, smart homes, especially if you're going to work from home, you, you know, you're going to have to have uh, all of the, uh, the, the smartness and all of the equipment. I'm, I'm wondering if universal Wi-Fi, the public good, is going to come back and become a, 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 a driving force at the public sector level. One of the reasons because of the, of the kids going to school, if they're gonna have online schools, every kid has gotta have access to the internet and to, and to broadband uh, capacity. And I don't know that that's necessarily true. Commercial real estate, uh, I gotta warn you, most commercial real estate comes out on a quarterly basis, on a summary basis. And the first quarter data is gonna be misleading because the first quarter was all pretty good. Second quarter is going to be where it's going to come into play. Austin, you can see the rents have begun to turn over. This is uh, quarterly. The first quarter was already showing occupancy rates and, and uh, uh, apartments were already starting to slip just a little bit. That's the blue bars. And the rent per square foot uh, per month was beginning to, to take a little bit of a dip. Uh, here's the overall office market in terms of base rent rates, uh, completions, absorption, and occupancy rates around the state. What you'll see, and uh, see on this is that Austin has been leading in terms of base rent rates and completions. The office market has just been going great guns uh, in Austin, but the look over there in the bottom right-hand corner, the net absorption is beginning to fall off, and that means that the office market in Austin is going to start doing some correcting probably in the coming quarters in terms of rents and, and occupancy levels. We'll have to see how that plays out. That, that's a four quarter moving average. So uh, it could pick back up, we'll have to see. And also because of the pandemic, uh, the demand for space is changing. The, the way the space is utilized, the, the, the physical configuration of the space is all going to be slightly different. We produce at the Real Estate Center a quarterly apartment report and a quarterly commercial report. These both just came out within the last couple of weeks, within the last week, actually. Uh, recenter.tamu.edu, it's our website. Just go under market research, or Texas economy, I'm sorry. Under research, go under Texas economy and you can scroll down and find these reports. They again are first quarter report uh, based on first quarter data. Uh, so again, we're trying to anticipate what it might look like in the second and third quarters, but it's, it's all guesswork at that point. Uh, but I do recommend if you're interested and want to get more detail, uh, more detailed slides and graphics. Let me, let me finish, and I know you've all been waiting for me to say, uh, say those two words, let me finish, or those three words. Uh, forbearance, uh, we're, we're real concerned of what that's going to do in terms of turning into foreclosures in the future. I think that that's about a year away, maybe six months to a year away before we start seeing it. Uh, I can tell you that just this morning I read an article about one company out of, out of Canada that just borrowed about a half a billion dollars at 2.5% uh, interest rate to buy distressed properties when all the foreclosures start. So there's a big market uh, coming around. They already own about 24,000 rental houses around the country, and they are going to go into that business. We're aware of other funds that are doing that. 
We are aware of funds being put together to buy commercial real estate as well uh, that goes into distress. We'll have to see how that works. Low interest rates are gonna still stimulate demand, uh, stimulate demand if the jobs come back and if the lenders kind of open up a little bit. You all know that the new technology and processes that we've been forced into for the last three months are gonna probably continue. They're gonna affect construction and brokerage and sales practices, title operations, lending operations, and the like. So we're gonna see that. Home construction, we think, could be a prime recovery activity, and it needs to be. Uh, that's, we, we think that's gonna happen. There's been pent-up demand that's coming through the market here the next month or so, this month and last month and next month. Uh, what'll be interesting to see is how that uh, wave of demand continues to go through uh, through the rest of this year and then picks back up uh, after the winter season, which is typically our downtime, which is normal, uh, but picks back up in February, March, and April of next year. All of that, I think, will depend on do we get a vaccine and do we get a vaccine that works and that's universally available at an uh, attractive cost. Commercial real estate investment and stuff, pretty much on hold, wait and see, uh, looking to see if uh, values change considerably or are impacted. I got to tell you that not yet. Uh, it's not readily apparent that there's value impacts. Everybody is anticipating some value impacts. I, I, I addressed the, uh, the MAIs not long ago, uh, and they agreed uh, that, that, that the, the hard data are not there right now to, to measure a value impact. It's all based on just the uh, Boy, I think, I feel, I, I want, I don't know. Uh, so we're just waiting to see how, how it all plays out. I thank you very much. I think I've run a little long. I appreciate your attention. And uh, Christine, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, Dr. Gaines, this has been fantastic. We've been letting people know in the chat we were going to run a little long which was fine. We love hearing from you. Um, if you are willing, we do have a lot of questions that have come in and I'll do my best if you're up for answering a few of them for us. Sure. We'll give them okay. a um, Aside from getting uh, the pandemic under control, what are the key drivers that may help our real estate uh, lead to recovery? Um, and will Austin and or Texas have an edge or an advantage, do you believe? Uh the, it, the, the uncertainty on the virus is the, is the big issue uh, and jobs. And, and you, we all know that Texas here the last month has tried to reopen. The case count went up. Now, it, and that's the two steps forward and one step back kind of thing. I think that I, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And my guess is we may go through this a couple of times. I don't think it's just going to be once until or unless we get a vaccine. And that doesn't look like it's imminent. So uh, okay. again, I think our recovery is going to to be you know two two forward, one back, and that and that kind of uh, of thing. The second part of the question um, it, is: Austin or Texas have an advantage? Yeah, I think we do. Uh, I think we do. Texas, we were doing very very well before all this hit, and we were probably even in position to weather the downturn and the in, uh, downturn in the energy uh, market. It was gonna hit, obviously it's hitting Medellin and Odessa. That's no secret, uh, sure. uh, pretty hard. It was a, having an effect in Houston and so that was going, but Austin is not really an, uh, an energy uh, town. It's, it's not dependent uh, that much on the, there's a it's just very minor uh, tertiary effect there. And, and uh, the high tech industry, that, that was more important uh, to the Austin's future. And that had leveled off a little bit. And then of course the Tesla announcement, if that should come to pass, uh, might, might have some impact. Also, if more people are gonna start working from home and doing, doing the telecommuting and so forth, that brings back the, the high tech and all of the, the services provided by the high tech companies that are in, in Austin. And then all of the, the surroundings. So yeah, I think Texas will do well. Uh, I, I don't know that we'll go through the same kind of boom that we had the last decade. And it's interesting because I've, I've even made these comments before. The decade of the 20 teens 
is going to go down as a phenomenal decade for the state of Texas. The decade of the 2020s, the decade we're just getting started with, and of course, we, it's a hell of a start here with the virus, uh, is going to be different. It, there's no reason to expect the same level of boom conditions. You almost don't want them because our infrastructure and a lot of other issues, uh, schooling and state funding and local funding for, for all kinds of services, really hadn't been able to keep pace with that. So, so a little bit of slowdown is not really necessarily a bad thing, but I think we stand in good stead to do well. We're still uh, a very attractive state with weather, with, with governments, governance, tax levels, despite the high property taxes, our total tax burden, burden mm -hmm. is not that bad. Uh, business is relatively, I mentioned this earlier, business is relatively easy to get into and out of mm -hmm. in Texas uh, right. without government uh, burden and regulation. So, so there's a lot, and we got the best Tex-Mex food in the world. So uh, <laughs> that all that all contributes to, to Texas. I think, and, and Austin in particular, Austin is still making all of the top five, top 10 lists of desirable places in America. Uh, to live. The, right. the, the quality of life, the, the appeal of the area is, is just phenomenal. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's still there and I think that'll go on into the 2020s. Okay, that's great to know. Um, I'm going to switch here to um, around the leasing and property management. On July 24th, eviction protection uh, for tenants is um, through the CARES Act will run out. How do you see the large amount of evictions that will take place affecting the rental market? It, it, uh, there, there's no doubt it's going to affect. Uh, and and uh, number one, we don't know if uh, somehow that uh, moratorium will be extended, sure. which is a possibility. Uh, it, it's gotten late in the game. If they're going to extend it, they've gotten really late in the game to do it. Uh, and, and property managers and owners are going to have to, to take a big, uh, deep breath about what to do, because if you evict a tenant, can you find a new tenant, uh, to, for replacement, or are you just going to have to accept it or, uh, somehow work around? Because the, the basic, what it really revolves around is cash flow. How, how do I make up the lost rental revenue and, and, uh, uh, take people out. Now, one of the other things is, is how many of these job losses that we, I, I cited to you that are actually furloughs or temporary layoffs, uh, even, they're not labeled as permanent firings or, or whatever. We just don't know how well that's going to come back. Now, the, the, uh, the supplemental uh, unemployment insurance uh, has helped a lot. Uh, the extra 600 bucks a week. Uh, statistically, I can tell you around the country, uh, it's being reported by the National Home, uh, Home Managers Association or multifamily uh, homeowners. Rents are being paid, surprisingly. Uh, it's a, it's a, at, at a relatively high level. It hasn't been as big a hit as what they thought it was going to be for people not paying their rent. Uh, so, so uh, the, is the apartment market going to get hit? Yeah, occupancy rates are probably going to go down a little bit. One of the things that's going to help, though, is it's probably going to discourage any new apartments being built, at least real. Now, all of them that are under construction and already in the process, those are coming in play. And there was a lot of them. Uh, so the competition is going to be there. We're also seeing more uh, doubling up, moving in together, uh, moving down from class A to class B because of rent levels and so forth. So there's going to be some dynamicism here of change that, that's going to happen. I, I wish I could give you a better answer. Uh, and then it's going to get down to case by case, property by property, and, and the ability to replace a tenant if you evict them. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Well, I think that's help, helpful. Um, how in, in going into the health insurance and, and looking at that area, how has the uninsured rate for health insurance in Texas? Um, and do you see that across the country? And is that going to be affecting things as well? Do you have any thoughts in that area? 
I, I don't have much thoughts. That's not my area. Area, that, okay. That I really, I really know much about. I, I suspect in the short run, uh, the lack of uh, of health care coverage uh, or health insurance coverage uh, is being picked up by the government. Uh, I'm not okay. aware of any of the hospitals or doctors. If somebody walks in with the virus, whether they have insurance or not, I don't think they're being denied service. Now, who's picking up the cost for that? Ultimately, the hospital is because if, uh, if they're not getting reimbursed from Medicaid or or mm -hmm. somebody else, and and my guess is that that uh, that uh, issue will go on for probably another year or two to figure out who's going to pay for what. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to um, looking at commercial space, um, do you see the possibility of redevelopment moving those from commercial projects into residential projects? Does have you heard anything around that area? Yeah, I've I've heard a lot of that, and mostly centered in the retail. Uh, okay. Reuse of retail or change of use, uh, particularly the malls. Now that's nationally. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the malls specifically in Austin, but power centers and others, uh, freestanding uh, uh, retail stores, freestanding restaurants, uh, of recycling, redoing, maybe changing them into uh, entertainment centers, uh, that kind of thing, service centers outpatient care. Uh, uh, I do know that uh, th there's been a run here on the, on the freestanding medical, the dock in a box. Uh, uh, that, that's been hot right now because people are going there for, for tests or whatever lab work, uh, except for some uh, like the dentists and the doctors and so forth who had to close down. And then their properties and their business, do they, do they reopen? Or do they all merge, go into a consolidated practice, and uh, and uh, uh, do that kind of thing? So it's uh, it's going to be interesting here, really, for the next year, to see how this works out. But yes, there's going to be redoing, if you will, uh, replanning, restructuring of of a lot of different properties. Great. Um, around affordability, we got a number of questions around affordability and what that means to different people. But um, can you comment on the need for a, the attainable housing and, and having affordability, what that's going to look like moving forward? <laughs> it's going to be like what it looked like before we had all this. Uh, Austin has uh, obviously issues with affordability. Austin is our most expensive housing market in the state. Uh, and and uh, that was the reason on the one on the on the big graph there I had or the chart table, uh, you can see the price differences between Austin and Travis County and in the central area compared to say Bastrop and Hayes County and so forth. And affordability is a is a big big issue. Uh, we're seeing some manufactured housing come into play. We're seeing uh, efforts to use uh, tax credit. Uh, uh, affordable housing projects, which is has limitations because of the amount of money available. So yeah, affordability is going to be an ongoing issue. I wish I had a silver bullet answer for you that if you just did X, it would be it would be all go away and be be solved. And I can tell you, incidentally, here at the center at the real estate center. Well, it's not here. This is my house. But but at the real estate center, we'll uh, we have been very actively uh, looking at. Uh, the affordability issue within most of our MSAs, including Austin, have been working with a number of different people and groups uh, to to try to get a handle on it and make some suggestions on what to do with it. Okay, great. Um, oh, supply chain, that was where I was going to go. Um, the, the, this person was asking, I know that there's highly uncertain, but how do you see... Uh, foresee the significant supply chain issues that we've had, or how will those, do you see those changing? Maybe manufacturing leaving, I guess, China and finding someplace else or moving things around so they're a little more regionalized. Talk to that a little bit, please. Uh, well, if you're talking about the international level, uh, I, I think that there's no, there's no consensus there of exactly how that's all going to work out. It's, it's, uh, it's taken a real hit here currently, but right now 
uh, there's so little trade and export and Im exporting and importing going on uh, that it's not altogether clear how that's going to work out. In the, in the coming months, in the next year or so, uh, I suspect that it's going to go back to, we've got it, you want it. Uh, one of the things happened uh, here that is current that, that will be an issue, lumber prices have gone up about twofold or threefold. Uh, the home builders pay, and we get most of our lumber from Canada. So, so uh, uh, those, that's one of those supply chain issues uh, that's going to have to be looked at uh, with the restrictions and potential restrictions. Uh, people are still nervous of moving, traveling, or, or sending goods across borders. Uh, so that's going to be a, a, a bit of a disruption. And that's going to last again until or unless we get the virus under control. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, and then you talked about uh, San Antonio with increased prices. What do you attribute to the increase in San Antonio to um, in the home price area? Now, San Antonio has been a remarkable market. I, I, I wasn't going to belabor it because this is an Austin audience. Sure. Uh, but, but San Antonio has been a, a really remarkable uh, uh, market. Job formation for the last couple of years has been very good. Uh, the housing market there is tight in terms of supply, uh, as it is in Austin, which is has any, economics 101, high demand, low supply, you're going to get higher prices. Uh, Austin has, been, has, has basically hit the radar, if you will, of developers and investors and so forth as a place to go, as an, as an opportune city, uh, mainly because, of course, it, it is. And, and uh, it's in Texas. Texas has been growing. And, and Austin has been one of those markets that historically, for the last two, three, four decades, kind of overlooked. Uh, it had as its economic base uh, tourism and military. Of course, the military closed down a bunch of uh, installations, uh, so it's a fraction of what it was. But the tourism trade, now, it's been hit hard here with the, with the uh, impact of the virus because of tourism, uh, the unemployment and particularly service workers and that kind of thing with the hotels, the restaurants, everything tied to tourism, the Fiesta Tech, you know, the, the theme parks and all of that that goes mm -hmm. along with it. Uh, I don't mention bars, but you know, bars are included. Uh, so it's, it's gotten hit that hard, but, but Austin has done remarkably, remarkably well. And, and like Austin uh, is, is one of those communities that's beginning to be recognized as a great place to be. Uh, if you live somewhere else in the country and you're looking for a great place to live for all of the quality of life and amenities and a place to raise a family and enjoy yourself, Aust uh, San Antonio, like Austin, is a really terrific place. In fact, uh, I defy anybody to drive up and down I-35 now and, and take the two-hour drive to get there and and uh, and start differentiating. Of course, now it's also you know it's creeping into the Braunfels and on into San Marcos and Buda and and right on up the highway. It it's uh, Henry Cisneros. You know when he was mayor of San Antonio, kept talking about the Austin San Antonio corridor 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and the trouble was uh, Henry was just three decades ahead of his time. A little early. <laughs> He's just a little early. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got a couple more questions, then we're going to close it out for you. What was the last um, time inventory you think was this low? I think you may have seen the war, World War. Um, and how long did it really take to bounce back? I, I, the honest answer is I don't know that we have good enough data back long enough to tell you when it was this low. So okay. I'm, going to, I'm just going to make the, the uh, unsupportable statement that it's probably the lowest it's ever been, uh, uh, at least okay. in, any, in anybody's memory, uh, time of memory and so forth. Uh, and how long will it take for this? It, it, it's going to take a while. Now, how do, you, how do you get that inventory more in balance? Mm -hmm. It's just common sense. Either the demand is going to have to come down, 
or the supply is going to have to go up, or both are going to have to go up until they're, they're in balance. My guess is that most of us would not like to see or hear about the demand coming down that much. So what we'd really like to see is the supply to come up. Well, all right, for the supply to come up, we're going to have to start building houses a whole lot more mm -hmm. and a whole lot faster and maybe different types. Uh, and, and again, uh, we've been doing research on, on construction uh, techniques. Uh, uh, we, we've been working very closely with the Texas Manufactured Housing Association because they can produce you more units faster. And don't think trailer. <laughs> think a house that's simply built in a, in a facility and brought on site and assembled and constructed. And once it's finished, and I can tell you, I can show you these around the state, even in the Austin area already, uh, you would walk up and you would not know immediately whether it was a stick built or a manufactured sure. house. More flat packaged built in a it, manufacturing it, site. It, the, the technology has improved, the technique, mm -hmm. the process, they're, they're just as sound, they're just as fire resistant they're, they're, and so forth. They meet all of the standards and codes because they have to, by definition. Right. right. Uh, so, so this is one of the ways uh, we're going we're gonna to start seeing uh, some of this happen. Uh, the, the big issue is land cost. The thing that slows things down, land cost and that A, B, and C financing that I had the slide for you, that's the reason I pay attention to that. If lenders don't make acquisition, development, construction loans, that's the... That's the loan to the land developer to go out and acquire the next 50 acres or the next 100 acres and do the engineering and doing the site work and putting in the utilities and doing all of those things to create a, a lot that then a home builder can build the home on. Sure. That's what's caused a lot of the affordability issue is that the land costs have gotten so high that and it's about a six to one ratio. Your 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 final cost is gonna your final product is gonna be about six times the land value. Right. Well, if you, if your lots are a hundred thousand dollars, you're gonna wind up with six hundred thousand dollar homes. Mm -hmm. So the the trick is how do I get lots in the thirty forty fifty thousand dollar bracket? A little bit more of the land use code help would be. Well, there, there's all kinds of impacts on land mm -hmm. costs and we could spend the next hour on that. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you one last question then we are going to call it. Um, but we so appreciate your time. Um, Austin has what some, uh, one of our g gentlemen here is calling a lost summer with all our cancellations of major music festivals. Any idea on how we can recover that loss of revenue or position ourselves in the future. And I know that you need a crystal ball probably for this one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, my crystal ball looks more like an eight ball, you know, <laughs> in fact, I literally have one in my office at the office. I have an eight ball. Uh, some of this is just lost revenue. That's just simply lost. The, 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 the South by Southwest. I mean, it, it, it's, you're not going to make it, you're not going to make it up. The only thing you can do is again, and I hate to sound like a broken record. We got to get the virus under control. We mm -hmm. got to have uh, faith and, and confidence that, that it's, it's not health risky to attend a function or to put on a function uh, like this. And when that happens, uh, when we get there, then we can reopen these things and have football. I mean, right now, are we going to even have a football season? All right. Now, for Texans, that's the real question. They don't care about these other things. I want to know if we're going to have a football season. And, and, and to tell you the truth, that looks like it's up in the air. Right. Uh, uh, I've been trying to you – know, I'm a bit of a sports fan, so I've been watching it. Uh, two or three of the conferences doing this, that, and the other. Some are not going to have football at all. High school football, college football, pros, don't know. Right. Uh, so some of this is just, you know, you, you, you're going to have to just sit back and wait and watch. But again, if we get the virus under control, get a, vi a, a vaccine or, or a, 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 an antibody there that we can do, rely on, then we can go back to quote unquote life as normal. So, so forth. Okay. Other than that, I don't know. I don't see how you ever make it. <laughs> 
On that note, I want to thank you so much for your time um, and, and, and thank Roxanne from Austin Title joining us today as well. Um, I know Emily had to jump off, but we wanted to definitely get to some of these questions. Um, thank you for attending everyone. We hope you enjoyed today's speaker series.